Hey there students, I'm going to go ahead and give you a lecture on reform in Britain between 1815 and 1848. Going to break this up more than likely into a few parts. Going to start with the situation leading up to the Reform Act of 1832. And since we're talking about English politics, let me give a quick shout out to everybody watching in Shetland where the ponies come from. Like, I was just shocked. People actually watch my videos there and that's awesome. So uh, thank you uh, all of you in Shetland who are supporting my work on Twitter and all of that kind of stuff. So let's go into this as far as the Reform Act of 1832 and the circumstances le leading up to it. So Karl Marx, uh, who wrote the Communist Manifesto and all of that kind of stuff, he believed that in the early 19th century, the conditions in England were ripe for a proletarian revolution. He thought this is the first industrialized country. It's going to happen here first. But it's not how it happened. So let's see why things happen the way they did instead of a massive revolution that there's really not one. In fact, with the revolutions of 1848, ends up being pretty quiet in England compared to other places on the continent. So Parliament was made up of the House of Lords and the House of Commons. Those bodies still exist, and the House of Lords is still made up of hereditary nobility and church leaders. Now, the House of Commons at the time was elected, not in the same way it is today, where all citizens get to vote for their MPs, but there was very, very limited suffrage. There were property requirements, not only to vote, but also to hold office. You had to hold a certain amount of property, typically landed property, to vote, and then a certain amount of property, even higher than that, if you wanted to hold office. And so the House of Commons was dominated by landowners. In fact, there were people in the House of Commons who said that the House of Commons could buy the House of Lords four times over. And the thing that's kind of complicating representation at this time are rotten boroughs. Okay, now what a borough is, is a district, town, or administrative unit. In this case, it's kind of like a congressional district or a parliamentary district or something like that. And so this borough is, you know, this unit of representation, but the problem is that the population had shifted. You know, with the Industrial Revolution, you've got people moving out of the rural areas and into cities. And imagine if in the United States, for example, we were to have a presidential election and we were to use the electoral vote allocation from the 1912 election. Well, if you look here, you see that California and Florida are still very small states uh, at this time as far as population. Things have changed in a hundred years. Now, in the U.S. Constitution, districts are reallocated, the states are reallocated representation every 10 years according to the Constitution. But at this time, Britain did not have a systematic uh, way to reallocate the districts. And so the districts did not represent the realities of representation. So you still had these rotten boroughs where nobody lived anymore, but they still had uh, a member of parliament. Whereas a lot of these cities that are sprouting up, like Manchester and Liverpool, they have the same representation that they had before the Industrial Revolution. So this is inherently unfair fair that the rural areas are being represented much more than the urban areas. So the political parties that sprouted up at this time, the Tories and the Whigs, now this goes all the way back to the late 17th century, but what's going on here is these two parties, the Tories who will become the conservatives and the Whigs who will kind of evolve into the liberals, the Tories represented the landed gentry, whereas the Whigs represented this emergent class of businessmen. And as far as the rotten boroughs, they allowed the Tories, who represented these rural districts, to control Parliament. And to enrich themselves, all right? Because they're the ones who get to vote, they're the ones who are represented, and so they got to pass laws like the Corn Laws in 1815, which were a protective tariff on foreign wheat, or corn, as they would call it there. In the United States, when we think corn, we think, well, Corn, all right? That's what we think about in the United States. But as far as this goes, corn, because I guess wheat technically has some corns, and, you know, what we call corn in America is a derivative of wheat or something like that. 
I, I'm no farmer, I'm a historian, and so I'm just going to kind of stick with what I know. But just know that the corn laws, uh, by our standards, were not even about corn. Now, as far as, uh, you know, they say in Shetland where the ponies are, maybe they still call wheat corn or something like that. And maybe this is just something about uh, American English versus British English. So, you know, which in the international world, that means that y'all are right and we're wrong. So, you know, go, moving on. Now, as far as the corn laws, what it did, was it said, okay, we're going to place a tariff on foreign wheat because we want to protect the prices of wheat in this country, all right, domestic wheat. So we want to make sure that the people who grow the wheat, the landowners, keep in mind that ever since the agricultural revolution, that you've got these landowners who have these large farms, okay? You've got this commercial farming, and you don't have a lot of small farms. So it's really the rich people who are making the most money off of this because the prices are artificially jacked up because of of the protective tariff. Now, of course, when we get into liberalism versus conservatism, liberalism is more about adopting free trade like uh, Adam Smith or something like that. But free trade does not enrich the landed gentry at this time. So the Corn Laws are enriching the landed gentry at the expense of everyone else. And at this time, only 1 in 12 adult males could vote before 1832. And not even a wealthy factory owner could vote because the way that this was uh, was allocated and ruled that you had to have a certain amount of landed property, that it wasn't enough that, hey, I own a factory and I've got, I can prove it, I've got all these children working for me and all of that kind of stuff 12 hours a day. So, all right, you still can't vote. And so keep in mind that the first people to agitate for the vote are not the working class, but the class of people that owns the factories. And what you see here, you see that here are the, the Whigs who are trying to cut down the rotten borough system, and then there are the Tories who are trying to hold it up, because you have people who have a vested interest in this system. It's like, hey, if only 13 people live in my district, then you know, that makes it very easy for me to be represented in Parliament, basically representing myself, and I just have to shake a few hands or whatever, and we have a little mock election. And so there there are people who want to hold this up, and then there are people who want to tear it down, and that has to do with, well, um, who benefits. And so the landed class is trying to defend this, while the industrial class is trying to cut it down. And so finally, the Reform Act of 1832 is passed, and redistricting is put into place to reflect the population shifts, and the rotten boroughs no longer exist after the Reform Act of 1832. And then we see suffrage for the urban middle class, okay? It lowers the property requirements and kind of amends them so that you no longer have to own land, and perhaps you don't have to be quite as rich as you had to be before. So now, instead of 1 in 12 being able to vote, 1 in 6 adult males can vote. So you have twice as many people eligible to vote after the Reform Act of 1832 than before. But then again, 5 out of 6 men still could not vote. So you still have a lot of people who are disenfranchised. And there is no suffrage for the working class. And that's what we'll get into in the next segment of this lecture about the Chartist. So stay tuned, click there to go ahead and go to the lecture on the Chartist, part two really, of this lecture. Thank you.